the desire to be for real. Any of you remember that? The desire to be authentic and how it's so difficult to do. It's like we become conditioned to being ingenuine because after all, that's just the way the world is. Nice people finish last. If you went to Sunday school, you may remember that verse. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Anyone remember that from Sunday school? Yeah. <laughs> How is it actually so, though? How do the meek inherit the earth? They'll be buried three feet under. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, we would like to be genuine, but it just seems impossible. And you don't get anywhere being genuine. Perhaps, as we were discussing last night in Los Angeles, you can remember looking into someone's eyes and saying, I'm for real. <laughs> Any of you ever done that before? Uh, were you really for real? Huh? No, it was just kind of a real cool thing to say, right? <laughs> yeah? Anyone else besides it? Anyone else? Yeah. It just... There's a yearning in the human being to have a magic moment of resonance, of connection. So you just say what you need to say to try to somehow or other create that moment, even though it may be artificial. After all, what else are you going to do, right? What else are you supposed to do in this world? Who knows what's real anyway? So you might as well just uh, ad-lib. You might as well just... Uh, fabricate something just to, uh, you know, <laughs> keep the ball rolling. I don't know what else is there to do. And remember how you can always cop out. You didn't make the world this way, right? <laughs> you just have to be living in this world which has been messed up by others. And you're just doing what you have to do to get over and get by. That's all. <laughs> It's those other people who really uh, done major damage in this world. And you're just mm, making your way through the, through the mess as best you can. So who can blame you? You've got to achieve your goals. Uh, you've got to interact with material nature. Uh, it may be that a few people get hurt in the process, but you didn't mean it. Well, that's life in the big city, right? I mean, because you didn't mean it, and it's just natural there's going to be some fallout, there's going to be some mm, some problems. But the here's the main thing. Life is a game of musical chairs. How many of you played musical chairs when you were? Yeah. <laughs> So, did you, do you remember the embarrassed feeling when the music stopped and you didn't have a chair? Do you remember what that Think back. What does that, what, what does it feel like? Oh no, I don't have a chair. Remember you tried to squeeze onto the chair for another kid, right? <laughs> yeah, come on, let's share it. Move over. Uh, it was such an embarrassing feeling. So, we maintain that kind of uh, syndrome uh, all of our life. We don't want to be uh, found uh, to be wanting. We don't want to be uh, in any way missing out. Here's an example. Uh, smartphones. It's like he's got a smartphone there, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, Mm. You would think that the smartphones bring people together more and make for more intimate communication because you can be in touch with your friends all the time. But here's what's actually going on, according to psychologists. These smartphones have led to an increase in depression because what happens is your friends, while you're at home, bored and, and, and not having anything fun to do, your friends are out at a club or at a restaurant and they can just call you and show you a video of what they're doing. We're having a great time. Here's Roger, here's Mary. We're, here we are sit, uh, seated at this restaurant. I wish you were here. 
So actually, psychologists have pointed out these smartphones are causing an increase in depression because people are flashing their good times uh, uh, to their to everyone in their circle. And then those who aren't in on the good times that night feel so bad. <laughs> Just see. <laughs> what is supposed to be a great advancement turns out to have negative effects on human psychology. So, there's always some insufficiency. And that perpetual uh, perception of insufficiency, it troubles you. You want to really get into things. I know so many persons in this room. You want to really just get into life and get all it can offer to you. But at the same time, you've seen so many times that you've come up uh, short that you can't get what you need to nourish and sustain yourself. So please admit that. It's not a a disgrace to admit that you you haven't been able to get what you need to sustain and nourish yourself. It's a sign of intelligence to realize that uh, existence, material existence specifically, uh, doesn't have the nourishment we require. So we should stop beating up on one another. We should stop uh, looking for other persons or things to blame. And we should understand that our problem is with material nature. Now, how did we get involved with material nature? Hmm. Sometimes people can, in, they can intuit. There's something spiritual about me. I'm not just simply the body and mind. But then the next question is, how did you start, as pure spirit soul, how did you start flirting with the material energy to the extent that you really got entangled? What happened? So now we get to the point in which we consider the material energy, material existence, to be necessary. And even offering fulfillment. Let me just take off my sweater and I'll explain an experience I had two days ago uh, with one of my dear associates. We went to San Francisco State uh, the college there and we were talking to the students. Uh, so <clears throat> we asked all the students like, you know, just to get them to stop and also because we were interested in their lives uh, what what are you what are you majoring in and so we go, oh uh, business or uh, ph philosophy San Francisco State is a, I've been told is uh, specializes in liberal arts so we encounter quite a few philosophy majors criminal justice that was a big one uh, so in talking to these students, I could see that they had a hope that this world will provide fulfillment in some kind of way. Maybe you won't get everything you want, but there'll be a partial delivery of what you want and need, and therefore some other things will be all right. You remember having that feeling? That... I'm not going to get everything, but I think that the universe will at least give me something special, because after all, I am special. Yeah, do you remember feeling like that? There's some special destiny. I don't know what it is, but there's got to be some special destiny out there for me. And if I just persevere, if I just go on struggling, uh, somehow or I'll stumble upon it. Now, could it be considered that actually the universe has nothing in store for us that's special? <laughs> Perhaps it's just the same old, same old. Maybe we have uh, artificially 
uh, even crazily uh, built up all these expectations of what material existence is supposed to give us. Maybe we're just hallucinating. Maybe material existence owes us nothing. You ever been around someone who thinks everyone owes the person a favor? <laughs> well, that's how we approach material existence. It owes me a favor just because I'm alive and here. Something has to happen my way. There's something out there for me. The truth is out there somewhere. My truth. Not everyone's truth, but my special truth. Okay? Something that will work for me. So we have this sense that we uh, need, we need and are due a, some kind of special destiny. So is it a rude awakening when we see that we dare consider that there's nothing special that material nature owes me. There's nothing special it's going to give me. Uh, if I indeed want to tune in to something special, I have to get off the material platform. So those of you who have read Bhagavad Gita, you know that's the thrust of Krishna's instructions. To get you off the platform of illusion. But we're very, very attached because we don't know what else to do with ourselves. And it takes a brave person to admit, I don't really know what to do with myself. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know how many of you here are prepared to say that. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that you say in a, in a sophisticated city that I don't know what to do with myself. This is actually what's going on. And because we don't know what to do with ourselves, we hold on tightly to so many unnecessary things. And, and that way we create problems for ourselves. Mm. Like this morning in Los Angeles, at the temple there, I was telling a true story, something that happened to me while I was touring Ukraine. And there was a family of bhakti yoga practitioners. And they had a little boy who was four years old and the little boy of his own accord decided he wanted to give me he wants to give you something that's very special for him he wants to make a special presentation to you he wants to give you his favorite little toy truck <laughs> wasn't my idea so <laughs> so the parents brought him into the room where I was sitting and the four-year-old boy was carrying his, his his favorite toy truck. He was walking toward me with a very sincere, devotional look on his face, and uh, I was just watching to see what would happen. And the parents saying, "Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on." Uh, it wasn't my idea, so I wasn't encouraging it, but I was just watching. And so, the little boy, the four-year-old boy, got about oh three feet away from me. And then he started looking at the truck, <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> and, he, and he just burst out crying. <laughs> and he buried his head in the, you know, on his mother's leg, you know. And <laughs> you had to take him out of the room. <laughs> you know, he just started considering, wait a minute, <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite truck. <laughs> Do I really want to get this? <laughs> this truck means the world to me. <laughs> So, that was the end of that. I returned to that city three weeks later, and the parents told me, hey, this time he's really ready. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, what he did, just to ease uh, his attachment, uh, he went out and had us buy you a new toy truck. No. <laughs> Different from the one he's so attached to. So they brought the little boy in again, and he approached me with a brand new little toy truck, still in the box with this, you know, the cellophane window on it, you know, plastic window, whatever. You, know, you could see it inside. And so again, he started coming toward me with this new toy truck that was in a box that was unopened, and 
he didn't have to give me his, his, his the toy truck he was so attached to, his favorite one. Now it was a new one. So as he got close to me, I saw what happened. He started looking at the at the box. <laughs> <laughs> this actually looks like a good truck. <laughs> I started, you know, looking through the, the plastic window. You know. <laughs> and you can just see, like as Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, by contemplating the object of the senses, attachment develops. So he was in a heavy contemplation, intense. <laughs> this truck is actually really good. Look at it. Then he would look up at me like, what are you going to do with this anyway? You don't, you don't know how to play with trucks. You, you don't know the goal of life. So he, he kept walking and looking down at the toy truck box and looking at me. And then once again, as soon as he got close, <laughs> and he ran and buried himself and his mother. So we're like that. This is how we approach life. Uh, we have so many toy trucks, right? So many little dolls. And we make such a big deal out of them. Because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> and even our intuition tells us that there's something suspect about all this. Uh, we're not really uh, getting the nourishment that we need. We're not even getting the authenticity that uh, a basic human being requires. We're not getting that genuineness. So, we have different ways of responding when this kind of uh, intuition hits us. We can mm, just say, well, that's the way it is. I didn't make the world this way. Resignation. Uh, or we can just uh, be in denial. Well, you know, it may seem to be an illusion, but actually, uh, <laughs> everything is fine. Everything is beautiful in its own way. You just got to think like that, you know? Magical thinking. It's all about what you think. When you're walking down the street and you start thinking intensely about a strawberry ice cream cone, don't be surprised when someone comes up to you and says, Hey, would you like a strawberry ice cream cone? This is the way the universe works. Right? The secret. This is you it's just you just gotta think. And it comes to you. The universe supplies. This is living in denial. And then there's a another option which I was surprised is very popular. I was speaking about it last night at the Bhakti House in Los Angeles. The defiance, the rebellion. Look, so what if it's an illusion? I don't care. I'm going to get what I want, what I need. Why? Why do I have to curb myself, control myself? So what? It's all unreal. So what? Everyone's being fake. I don't care. I'm just going to get what I want anyway. Yes? I see some heads nodding that year. <laughs> What's all this thinking and philosophizing for anyway? Just, just do your thing. Assert yourself. Get what you need to get over and get by. <laughs> That's what the world's all about, right? <laughs> there may be love. There may not be love. Don't make an issue out of it. Just do what you got to do to fill the weekend. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, this defiant <coughs> approach is very popular, whether we realize it or not. I'm tired of thinking. I'm tired of wondering. Just go out and get it somehow or other. Now, it so happens that as we try to push on our life, everyone finds out that there are very, very... Ah, mm. tricky situations uh, those of you who have read Bhagavad Gita you remember the, the very complex and tricky situation Arjuna found himself in uh, having to fight a battle against his own relatives and friends and former teachers uh, and this circumstance has caused Arjuna such uh, Mm. anxiety to the point of depression. He actually had a, a psychological breakdown due to this existential crisis. So these crises come upon every human being. It's just a matter of time. Because the world isn't 
as it appears to be. That's why <laughs> Krishna uses that term maya, that which is not. It's not like what it looks to be. So if you always keep that in mind, if you can see through uh, the perceptions that Krishna is giving you, you'll actually be able to detect what's going on. Uh, you won't be uh, hoodwinked. You won't be bewildered. So, we're not really seeing the show that's going on. And, and therefore we get so caught up in very complex, precarious situations in which we feel like we're balanced on the edge of a cliff and we could just topple over any moment. And oh, this, this, these feelings just tear at our heart, uh, cause us so, such anxiety, just like Arjuna. Uh, his body was trembling, tears were in his eyes. Uh, he dropped his bow. Uh, he, he was just overwhelmed by the situation. So this happens to everyone in life. The intelligent person who wants to face reality starts thinking, what kind of existence is this that I've gotten so implicated in this present situation, which I don't understand what's going on, and I try to be for real sometimes, but the others aren't trying to be for real at all. And I can't be for real all the time because you know that doesn't work. So how do you how do you how, uh, how do you figure out what to do? H who's right? Who's wrong? Does anyone know? Hmm. I'll give you an example, uh, a true story, and let's see what you have to say. We'll, we'll, we'll go over some case studies of existence and you can weigh in on these case studies mm, just like you have in Bhagavad Gita the case study of Arjuna uh, he was overwhelmed by a crisis a very sticky situation as I said these predicaments are normal in human existence so here's case study number one it's a true story uh, anyone here been to Argentina? Alright, no. So, you may remember that uh, 30, 35 years ago, there was a military dictatorship in, in, in Argentina. And they would get rid of their so-called leftist foes by disappearing them doing things like just herding hundreds of people into a big airplane, driving them out over the, over the Atlantic Ocean and just pushing them out of the plane. That's how they took care of their <laughs> political undesirables. Another thing they did was <clears throat> kidnap, the military would kidnap babies. Uh, so here's an example of how that happened. Uh, there was, this is a true story. There was this girl, and she was raised by a military, high-ranking military officer in Argentina, by, and uh, she always assumed that's her father and mother. Uh, and as a little girl, the, the father would always take her to military headquarters and, and discuss with her present as a little girl with other military officers uh, how they have to torture and kill in order to preserve truth and justice. Uh, and she saw also uh, priests uh, giving tacit approval that if the, if the leftists take over, then they'll be anti-Christian. And so uh, even though the military is adopting extreme methods, we have to just let it happen. So this little girl was raised in that way. Uh, and then when she was about 20 years old, after the military dictatorship uh, went away, um, uh, people started contacting her and telling her, are you sure that's your mother and father? Are you sure? And she would, of course, of course, of course. Uh, she didn't want to hear anything else. Uh, even uh, her 
father was briefly detained, very briefly, for uh, possible investigation into uh, kidnapping babies, but still, she had her blinders on. No, 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 no. And so finally, uh, <coughs> the court ordered that she should have a DNA test, and she agreed. And then the DNA test revealed that she was the daughter of some activists who had been tortured and murdered by the person she thought was her father. And by that time, she was 30 years old, married with three children. And those three children considered her, her quote-unquote father to be their loving granddad. So... <laughs> <laughs> you can just see uh, the situation has just built up. There's so much emotional bonding. She actually considered, without a doubt, that man to be her father <laughs> and the woman to be mother. Uh, and now she's 30 years old. She's got three kids, and the three kids love their granddad. And uh, and then she, what happened? She kept being in denial. No, no. Uh, this can't be true. Uh, she was in denial about the atrocities the military did. No, no. Uh, it may seem like they did that, but they, that's just... All these accusations are lies. The military was trying to stop these atheistic uh, leftists from controlling the country. So anyway, when she was 30, her father took her to a restaurant, and in the middle of dinner confessed you know actually you're not my daughter uh, your parents were leftists the military had to deal with them we tortured them we executed them and then we took you in here as our child so all these 30 years you've been thinking this is mommy this is daddy but uh we're not your real mother and father, and your real mother and father I personally disposed of. Whew. You just think, how, how would you, how would you, what would you do in that, in that situation? This is a real life situation. What would you do? Uh, she explains it in this way. For another 10 years, she had to struggle with this truth. Uh, in fact, three years after this so-called father told her this, she uh, visited him in prison because he had to go to prison and he died in prison. Uh, and it took her like 10 years to fully process because as she explains it, human beings aren't machines. They just can't one minute love someone as father for 30 years and the next minute just turn the switch the other way. It's not like that. There's no reset button, instant reset button on human beings. You know, family life is a very emotional, intense thing. Someone you thought raised you with love and affection and protected you from the evil world, you find out all these things. So now she says uh, that she doesn't hate her so-called father and she doesn't love him either. Uh, she's changed her last name back to her original, her real parents. And she's had to explain to her grandchildren that their so-called grandfather was not a military hero, he's a murderer. She had to explain that you know, to, to grandchildren. This is real life. These things happen. So what would you do in that kind of situation? How would you consider that? Tough karma? What would you do? Oh, it's so intense, it's hard to even place oneself in that kind of scenario. Yes. Um, you maintain you maintain affection for you know what they what they did for you materially or whatever, but you you know how you go. You just chant and hang out with the buddies. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> Knowing that the person you loved as father and mother, who raised you, you know, because they, uh, this military uh, 
officer took her away after his, he killed her parents he, when she was 13, you know, 13 days old. Oh so, you know, <laughs> that's all, all she's known is him. And he was a firm, caring man. And he had firm, strong political ideas, and, which he indoctrinated her with. And then you find out you're not his biological child and he killed your biological parents. And by that time you have grandchildren, you're married and you have grandchildren. And your grandchildren, you know, climbing on granddad's lap, but you know, <laughs> if you have children, you know, the loving relationship for granddad. And then you have, you have to reverse it all in yourself and in your children. So her conclusion was, human beings don't have an instant reset button. <laughs> Yes, it's a very intense situation. Now, consider the situation Arjuna was in. Mm. He had the highest integrity. And he was thrust into a situation where persons who were very dear to him uh, had to... F he had to face in combat. Uh, and Krishna was urging him onward. Even to this day, people get bewildered reading Bhagavad Gita. Why is Krishna doing that? All Arjuna wants is peace. <laughs> he doesn't want to fight his friends, his relatives, his former teachers. What's wrong with that? What, what's, what's, what's going on with Krishna? Why, why is he doing this? Krishna is showing us that life is full of these very sticky situations and you require knowledge, deep, insightful, <laughs> transcendental knowledge. Otherwise, which way should you, you go? The persons that Arjuna had to fight had caused moral havoc. But still, that sense of kinship, it was an extended family. It wasn't like he was fighting his own brothers and so on and so forth. It was a big extended dynasty as they had in ancient times. So they were wrong and Arjuna was supposed to stand up for what is right. He was a military man. He had a code of ethics. But that code of ethics broke down when he looked on the other side when he looked across the battlefield and saw friends, relatives, and former teachers, he was so shaken. And at the end of the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna said, Govinda, I shall not fight. I can't. Ladies, place. That God forbid that would happen to me, right? <laughs> you have to repudiate someone who you thought lovingly cared for you for, for decades. She couldn't do it right away. Gradually she changed her name back to her, bio, her real biological parents, even though they were dead. Gradually she reprogrammed her, her children to reject granddad. It's tough. This is what goes on in the world. How, do you, how can you be for real in these kind of circumstances? Alright, I'll give you another case study. I think this one might be easier for you to deal with. <laughs> it's a true story. Mm. It involves an aunt I had. Uh, Javida Prabhu and I were both from New York. And so my, my aunt lived in New Rochelle, which is a suburb of New York. My father lived in New York City. So <clears throat> she was a very... Uh, Mm, how do we say? Cosmopolitan lady. And she married uh, a cosmopolitan wealthy doctor. And together they were living in a place, I guess, like Manhattan Beach or something. So uh, then when she was in her late, when she was in her 50s, yes, in her 50s, she got multiple sclerosis. And so she was bedridden, and she couldn't move. Eventually, she couldn't move any muscles. And of course, <clears throat> her husband, being a doctor, gave her excellent medical treatment, arranged all the best medical care for her. They lived in a big house, a big mansion. Uh, so everything, you know, seemed to be the best that could be done in those circumstances. 
I mean, just think about yourself. Uh, you come down with multiple sclerosis, your, all your muscles are becoming wasted and useless in your body, but you married a doctor, and a doctor with money. You could say, well, at least something's going your way, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what happened? I heard about this from my father at the time uh, of, uh, of the incident. Um, the, uh, my aunt found out that although her husband, the doctor, was caring for her so nicely and arranging all the topmost medical attention, he was also having some recreational affairs on the side. <laughs> <laughs> As my father explained it to me. Uh, you have to bear in mind that my father's, uh, my father's guru, I don't know if you, you may not all recognize the name, my father's guru's name was Hugh Hefner. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, he was he was explaining to me, you know, what what's wrong with your aunt? I mean, you know, give us a break, you know. I mean, you know, she's got multiple sclerosis, you know, she's bedridden, you know, all her muscles are useless, and her husband's taking such nice care of her, and but you know, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, he just he just needed to express himself. <laughs> you know, what's the problem? You know, he just needed to, uh, you know, have so have a few interactions. You know what I mean, son? Call it, you know, call them biological interactions, whatever you want. But you know, this is part of life. And now your aunt has so has flipped out so much that she wants a divorce. <laughs> this is crazy. You know, man's got to do what a man does, you know. <laughs> Why is she overreacting in this way? So it caused a whole mm, uh, split in the family. Some relatives stood up for uh, the man. Other relatives stood up for uh, my aunt. So what would you say? Aunt. <laughs> Why? Um, probably because when they got married, they expected for for health or death or death was part sick or you know better for worse, and that means like you know that you're you're faithful to them. Mm. Okay. <laughs> That's generally. That's the idea. The idea of, yeah, the idea. Mm. Okay. Also, anyway, else. Also, I mean, she's sick, so that's awful that he would just take care of himself like that. I mean, <laughs> to hit her while she's down, like to to abandon her and to take care of himself in this mm. most selfish way when she's sick mm. and she's facing death. Mm. Like a friend uh, Gingrich. Gingrich. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The wife's dying of cancer. And he's, and he's He'll yeah, anyway. be the president soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I just kind of have a question. In both of these scenarios, isn't there like any forgiveness that to be brought forward? I mean, like we all we can't we automatically have an opinion, but then again, who are we to judge who's right and who's wrong? I mean, like, does that? Our, our place? Is that our position? Is that what we're supposed to do? That's, and, you know, like, a, yeah, that's a very uh, important angle. What's right and what's wrong? Who are we to judge? When you read Bhagavad Gita, you're thrust in, in the middle of that puzzle, that conundrum. Well, and there's also there's, there's a way of forgiving people and continue to love them at a distance. Like you don't have to live love at with a distance, their values, yeah. but you still forgive them and you love them and you understand that maybe they're stupid. Or whatever. I mean, they, they can't help themselves. I mean, they're selfish. They, you know, they're, right. so they have the issues. It's, you know. The so you the, the, the lady to forgive the man. I'm sorry? You want that lady to forgive the man. You want my aunt to forgive well, my uncle? Well, yeah. it would probably help her muscles. <laughs> <laughs> but how does she have how does she, resentment doesn't how does she exercise doctor? love at a distance <laughs> in those circumstances well how would she do that yeah well she would need to be in full communication what does that mean well she would need to express herself how she feels 
how the circumstances made her feel and how, like the other person mentioned, their vows were to be faithful to one another and that she feels violated. But that doesn't mean that he's a terrible, awful ogre or, you know, I mean, it's, I don't see how it's her position to, you know, to lay judgment. So you would try to hammer out some kind of uh, truce. Well, I mean, if she doesn't want to live with someone who has those kind of values, then that's totally respectable because they're different, but she doesn't need to judge him. She doesn't have to live with the doctor. She can just <laughs> move out and make her own home. Huh? <laughs> well, I mean, that's just there's all that stuff to deal with, but as far as where she comes from, where is the love in that? That's often a question we will ask. Where is the love? <laughs> Do we only love people that are nice and kind and sweet and all we, the time? Is we, that, we can get, anyone say they've never done anything wrong? We get so uh, caught up in this issue. Where is the love? That finally we decide we don't care. Where is the love? <laughs> you just got to be expedient. You just got to do what you got to do. Like Javita Prabhu was describing about... What's his name? Newt Gingrich. Yeah, you just, a man's got to be a man. Let's hear from some men. <laughs> be honest, man. Okay, we know the ideal. We know the the, the vows. <laughs> but, you know, uh, yes. There's a, a common argument um, that you know, cheating husbands like to use. Like, well, you know... I became captivated by this woman, or I had some physical, biological need, and you're, you know, emaciated. I couldn't fill it with you. I love you. Mm. You're, yeah. you're the one I love. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. I didn't love those other women. Yeah. Right. You're the one. They were I just love. play things. You're the one I married. You're the one yes. who takes care of. Yes. You know, just please forgive me for. No, don't Just call it cheating on you because it, it's not. Wait, forgive me for doing what most men would do. I wouldn't do any of this because at least I at least you I told you or you found out and I'm admitting. Any other? Any, how do you sort this out? You can't. It's like you couldn't with the urgent. There's no material answer to this. It's really a choice. Between what? And between the between the individuals, whether she's willing to forgive and continue on with their commitment of vows or not. It's very simple. She can choose to forgive or not. I mean, of her rage. Well, you know, she can choose not to. Hell forgive. hath no fire greater than a woman who's been scorned. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> You've never been there. Come on, be honest. You've never been there. But the question is, will that bring her happiness? You know, acting on that rage. You know, acting out. Is that really going to satisfy her? Yeah, I mean, you know, well, some psychologists will often tell you these days that you know, express your rage. It's healthy. Express greed. Express lust. <laughs> <laughs> and why is it that we still have so many unhappy people? Well, why? Yeah, you will. Why is that? As yeah. Yervita Prabhu <laughs> said, there's no actual solution on the material platform. Well, doesn't everyone experience those things, rage, frustration? So it's what you do with it. It's what you turn that into. So she could turn that rage or that burn or that scorn into like the deepest spiritual fertilization of her life. Or oh, so where does she go to find that deepest spiritual fertilization? Where does she go? Where do we, uh, how does she get off of the material platform? How does the Argentine lady get off the material platform? How does Arjuna get off the material platform? That's why we're asking you. Ah. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> mm. The first lesson that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita is so important. And we shouldn't think that we're far beyond that first lesson. Krishna chastised Arjuna, telling him, You think you're intelligent, but you're you're foolish because you are identifying the body as the self. You're so absorbed in feelings about relatives 
that you're even overlooking the great harm that these relatives are doing. You've lost sight of uh, what is the correct course of action. You've lost sight of ethics, and you've even lost sight of what I want you to do. Of course, to understand what's so important uh, about Krishna's plan, you have to understand Krishna. And that's the most fascinating thing about Bhagavad Gita. You have to come to grips with who is Krishna. Otherwise, you may have some resentment about Krishna. What are you pushing war for? <laughs> Why are you such a war hawk? <laughs> so just like you're trying to grapple with this situation about the Argentine woman and as well as my aunt, uh, it's much more uh, profitable for you to grapple with the Bhagavad Gita situation because it, it, it involves real existence. It really happened. You can go to India and you'll still find Kurukshetra there where the battle was fought thousands of years ago. So, my, what I'm trying to get at is that if we can approach Bhagavad Gita uh, as a handbook for dealing with our existence, as a, a manual for dealing with the existential crises that just come all the time, uh, we can really get a uh, deeper and uh, highly valuable approach to life. You see, what Krishna is speaking about in Bhagavad Gita is a whole systems approach. He, Krishna is not recommending just uh, mm, hit and miss solutions. Uh, just tinker a little bit over here, tinker a little bit over there. No, Bhagavad Gita is presenting you a, a whole system for mm, renovating your lifestyle. And it's completely possible. That's the amazing thing. Just like Arjuna was a military man and a family man. Yet, uh, Krishna presented to him a whole system for mm, expressing himself in the material world in such a way that he made uh, extraordinary spiritual progress. So that kind of spiritual technology is what we need. Otherwise, we're going to be thrashing about in countless situations like I described. But we try to hide from that reality. Oh, that might have happened to that person, but God forbid that it will happen to me. Uh, but those things happen to everyone. That's the way life is in this world. So, how do we have a real beacon shining ahead in our life so we actually know where to walk this is what uh, Krishna is presenting first begin with understanding you're not the body you're a spirit soul how do you live as a spirit soul <laughs> what do you do do you float through the air like a ghost or what do you do as a spirit soul <laughs> just think about it <laughs> everyone here will admit to being spiritual right yeah. Yeah. But what does that mean? How do you act as, as, as spiritual? Mm. The word has become so imprecise that any material activity you do, you can call spiritual. Right? Everyone has a spiritual girlfriend, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, when athletes, you know, win the game, they talk about, oh, that was such a spiritual feeling, <laughs> scoring the winning touchdown in the last seconds of the game. <laughs> or even, you, 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 can, you can read in sport, sports pages, they call, like, a very enthusiastic player on the team, he's the spiritual leader of the team. He, you know, <laughs> he, keeps, he, meaning he keeps the team spirit, the team enthusiasm. <laughs> the word spiritual has become so... Uh, Hmm? Abstract? Um, abstract, yes, but just so bent out of shape you don't know what it means or what it applies to. So how do you actually carry yourself as spirit soul within the material world? Once you know that, then you can start being for real and authentic. 
to be for real, to be authentic, we have to solve this uh, paradox of how the spirit soul conducts himself, herself, in the world of matter. And that's this topmost spiritual technology that Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita. So if you can get that down, you've got everything taken care of. You'd be able to maneuver through all these kind of uh, sticky situations I've described. Because things happen. Just like to Arjuna, things happen. 